Uh, a very good morning to one and all present here. I'm Reshma Raj Gopal, and I'm extremely glad to welcome you all to yet another Knowledge Leadership and Forum Lecture by none other than our very own Shri N. Venkatraman sir, Senior Advocate, Supreme Court of India. And the topic for the day is Constitutional Silence and Federalism. And before we begin with the proceedings, I call upon Krishnajat, third year BA LLB Honours, to invoke the blessings of the Lord Almighty. I request you all to please rise. Maitreem bhajata akhila khrujetri Maitreem bhajata akhila khrujetri Maitreem bhajata akhila khrujetri Atma va deva para nabi pashyata Atma va deva para nabi pashyata yudham त्यचत स्पर्धाम त्यचत युद्धम त्यचत स्पर्धाम त्यचत त्यचत परे शक्रममाक्रमणम त्यचत परे शक्रममाक्रमणम मैत्रीम भजत अखिल खुजेत्री जननी पृथ्वी का मधुहास्ते जननी पृथ्वी का मधुहास्ते जनको देवह सकल दयालो जनको देवह सकल दयालो था मेदादता था यत्वम जनता था मेदादता था यत्वम जनता श्रेयोद भूयात सकल जनाना श्रेयोद भूयात सकल जनाना श्रेयो भूयात सकल जनाना श्रेयो भूयात सकल जनानाम श्रेयोत भूयात सकल जनानाम थैंक यू कुरिशन जा आई नाउ कॉल अपॉन मानसा श्रीनिवासन थर्ड या बीकॉम एलएलबी टू डेलीवर द वेलकम एड्रेस Good morning to one and all present here. There are a plethora of people in this world, each one different from the other. Perhaps this is the reason that there are so many dreamers and achievers out there. The hard work that one puts in to achieve their dreams is what makes the difference between those who are successful in life from those who miss the mark. We have with us today a man who needs no introduction, especially to us here in Sastra. But it would be unfair if I don't do justice to all his accomplishments. For someone who started out in his early days by writing his arguments in a slate and rehearsing it in front of a mirror, his advanced argumentation and immense comprehension with clarity and conciseness has thrilled all his admirers. He has never stood up to argue a case without fully reading the brief and proper research. He worked under the guidance of senior advocate Mr. C. Natarajan between May 1989 and June 2003. He was one of the youngest to have been designated as a senior advocate in February 2006 at the age of 40. He has also appeared so far before 20 high courts and the Supreme Court of India, besides tax tribunals, settlement commissions and authority for advanced ruling and central appellate mechanism. He has appeared on various constitutional issues relating to taxation, leading matters in the field of international taxation, transfer pricing, service tax and VAT. Some of the decisions have also been adjudged as the best case for the respective years by the International Tax Fora. He had also appeared on 6 out of 10 best judgments in tax in the year 2016. Recently, he appeared before a historic 9-member constitutional bench regarding the NT tax matter reported in Jindal Stainless Steel versus Union of India. His various talks and lectures at prestigious institutions have added glitter to his achievements. 
His recent talk at the Think Edu Conclave, organized by the New Indian Express and Sastra University, was centered around the, to, uh, the need to reinvent legal education in India by laying emphasis on country, culture, and constitution. His lecture at the Madras uh, Chamber of Commerce and Industry in December 2016 on the experience of arguing in the Jindal stainless steel case brought out his remarkable conceptual thrust and national thought. For his varied accomplishments and commitment to the highest standard of integrity and probity, he earned encomiums from several justices, including none other than Honorable Mr. Justice Rohinton Nariman. Besides being a top-notch lawyer, he is also the most down-to-earth and humble human being I've ever had the good fortune of meeting. He is passionate about preserving and nurturing our traditions. He also runs a Veda and Sastra Patshala at Madurai with about 55 students and 5 teachers. His optimism and faith and importance of knowledge, hard work and simplicity defines his quest for professional and ethical excellence. We welcome you, sir. I would also like to welcome uh, our HOD, Dr. Ravishekra Raju, and uh, the uh, student and faculty members of Sastra. The topic for today's lecture is constitutional silences and federalism. Uh, eminent jurist Fali S. Nariman, in his article, The Silences in Our Constitutional, wrote that the silences in our constitutional speak louder than the words. Venkat Raman sir, along with re retired Supreme Court justice, uh, judges, Justice P. Venkat Raman Reddy, Justice A.K. Ganguly, and sitting Judge Justice Dr. Chandrachur, had delivered a seminar on the very same topic in the National Judicial Ac Academy, which was well received. It, was, it is very kind of you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to deliver today's lecture. I will not take up any more of your time. Without any further ado, please put your hands together for our very own Venkat Raman sir. Uh, thank you, Mansa. Uh, moving on to the presentation of a memento, I request the head of the department, Dr. P. Ravishekra Raju, to present the memento to our guest of honor, Shri N. Venkatraman. And now for what we've all been waiting for, it is my honor to call upon Shri N. Venkatraman to deliver today's lecture on constitutional silence and federalism. साक्षात परब्रह्मम तस्मै श्री गुरवे नमः आर बिलवेट हे छोडी सर आर टीचिंग स्टाफ्स एंड माय डियर चिल्ड्रन इट्स अ प्लेजर टू कनेक्ट वन मोर टाइम विथ यू ऑल सो नाइस टू सी दिस यंग इंस्पायरिंग फेसेस I don't know what dreams are running in your mind at this point of time, what you want to achieve, what you want to accomplish. <clears throat> India will give you that opportunity. India has the resource to give you that opportunity. You should only plan well and execute it. I wish each one of you the very, very best to succeed in your endeavors, in your dreams, and in your calculations. Very best of luck to each one of you. <clears throat> this land is not unknown to the doctrine of silence. In fact, we have, over a period of time, realized that silence, in fact, is the best form of communication. whether it's between friends, family, a real life situation, or the constitution. When 
father does something, if the mom nods, then we can take it as it has her approval. She winks, closing one of her eyes. Then the man is doing something wrong, is not to the standards or expectations of what she wants it to be. She frowns, then it's an act of dissent or even an anger. And when mother wants to handle something for her child through her husband, she invariably resorts to the mode of silence to achieve it. Effective things happen only in silence. <clears throat> in fact, when we worship our, our pantheon of gods, the most supreme deity which we, we conceive for contemplation and meditation is the idol of Lord Dakshinamurti. It's portrayed as the Guru who communicates bliss and transforms every Sishya into a blissful state through an act of silence. The whole communication or transformation of transcendental wisdom from the Guru to the Sishya happens in deep silence. So, Sound and silence is not something uh, so new or unique in our daily routines. It happens in every aspect of our life, including the constitution. Because this great document called the constitution is also drafted by only men, of course, people of great eminence. So, silence in a constitutional document is inevitable. All right. Before we jump into the <coughs> deep well of silence to explore how silence can be interpreted, if especially when it is so in a constitutional provision, let's broadly understand a few contours of how this constitution came into being in, in as our parent document guiding the destiny of the nation and its citizens and of course non-citizens too in some cases. Very interestingly this constitution was worked out roughly for three years between 46 and 49 and uh, having its base to five principal enactments across continents. You have the American Constitution as its base. Then the Canadian Constitution, Australian Constitution, our Government of India Act 1935, and also the Ireland uh, Acts of 1937. These are the five basic instruments which propelled the formation of our constitution. See, if you take, we have 395 articles and 12 schedules, whereas uh, US constitution has only nine articles. But it has, we have drawn inspiration from US constitution too. How, how have they split their constitution? Article 1 deals with the Congress. Article 2 with the executive. Article 3 with the judiciary. Article 4 with the states. Article 5 with the amending powers. And of course, Article 8, the Bill of Rights, which came later. So this is all the basic design of the US Constitution. But India is a pluralistic society, number one. <clears throat> we, we took over the responsibility of both the British 
uh, regime and the princely state both have to be integrated. And we have to cross through several threshold limitations before we could see through and achieve and reach this uh, level of a constitution uh, document. Our preamble, in fact, you should watch two YouTubes uh, 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 definitely if you want to have a basic idea of our constitution. Both these speeches have been rendered by His Lordship Justice uh, uh, Rohinton Nariman. Please go and watch. One is on the origins of the constitution and another is about the federalism through the, through the legislative process. He explains the nuances of Articles 245 to Articles 253 very eloquently. An idea of these two, if watching these two YouTubes and our each, will certainly empower you with a good insight and a broad idea of how we have reached this, uh, uh, this uh, moment of preparing a beautiful constitution for ourselves. He says that the preamble was written the last, not the first. Even though preamble forms part as the forerunner to the constitution, the preamble was prepared the last. Very interesting. And it says, why should they, why should, why have we declared ourselves as liberty, equality and fraternity? Liberty dealing with rights. Equality dealing with status and opportunities. And fraternity is something to do with the dignity of the individual. And through that process, reach the dignity of the nation. It's there. So he explains beautifully each one of these terms in his short speech of an hour. And it's available on the YouTube. Now, Let's get back. So we have got a constitution drawing inspiration from these five basic uh, enactments, the American constitution, the Canadian, the Australian, our government of India act 1935. And of course, a little bit from the Ireland constitution too. Fali Nariman, she was saying, has written a beautiful article on constitutional silences. Sounds and silences of the constitution. Now, he declares that when you want to understand constitution, you must understand it from three aspects. Very essential. You must always keep this in mind when you read our constitution. Whether you do it as a lawyer or whether you do it in a court proceeding or in a public domain or a judge who has to deliver judgment should also bear this in mind. The first cardinal principle is a written constitution cannot stand on its own. It needs to be patronized and it needs to be nurtured. Only then, unless it gains support, unless it is sustained with support and nurture, a constitution of a nation doesn't sustain for long. So this is one elementary requirement when you want to uh, retain your democratic norms on a constitutional platform. You need to nurture and respect and patronize the constitution. That's the first requirement. Now the second requirement he says, you would not have got this constitution without persuasion, accommodation and tolerance. Without these three, it is impossible to have got into a single holistic document called a constitution because we are a pluralistic society. So he says, he recommends that whenever you read constitution, whenever you need to interpret constitution as part of a court case, always when you find 
a provision in the Constitution to be in conflict, to be capable of diverse interpretation, capable of throwing fears, capable of throwing challenges, then console yourself that maybe this has been accommodated, maybe this has been done through persuasion, maybe this has been done to tolerate. Any one of the three or all the three put together. So you can't read constitution overlooking or forgetting these three norms. Then you will miss out the truth or the essence of why the provision was created at that point of time in what, with what intention. So persuasion, tolerance and accommodation. And he says if you allow somebody to draft a constitution today in India you would not have you would not be getting out a constitution the way you want it because we were more tolerant and more persuasive in 1950s rather than what we are today it would be an impossible dream to write or rewrite a constitution of this magnitude now the third reason he gives very important and this is something he commands courts to bear it in mind he says a constitution is something which is which has to live up for the past for the present and for the future so times to come it has to stay on and therefore when times to come it has to stay on there is a responsibility attached to the courts to ensure that it interprets it correctly now what do you mean by interpreting it correctly reading that English and then understanding the English meaning and then delivering the English sense into it no not at all he says he quotes the words of Justice Marshall of USA to say not to enlarge judicial power beyond its boundaries nor does fear to carry it to the fullest extent that duty requires. So he says two things. You can't see, in fact, Justice Nariman says in his speech, there is a difference between making laws and declaring laws. If you see Article 245, it uses the expression making law. legislature makes laws judiciary declares the law or interprets the law so judiciary cannot make the law then it becomes judicial legislation which is impermissible in our country so the difference between making the law and declaring the law courts can only declare the law as very valid or invalid it can't make the law. It can say an invalid law, a court can pronounce it to be void. Then legislature has to do the course correction. So making law is within the domain of a legislator and within the domain of the parliament and the state legislatures. So he says as a judge, a judge has a great role when we say judge, a court, when we say court, it includes all of us who will be there as part of the system. We have a responsibility not to overstretch the law. You can't cross the boundaries, no doubt about it. But doesn't mean you need not venture yourself in areas where you need to really occupy and see what the perception was and what its intended meaning was and how this should be given a meaning to the context which is before the court. Don't have fears there, says uh, Mr. Nariman. That's a third vital ingredient in interpreting a constitution. That is why courts have been repeatedly saying Constitution is not a pendantic document, it's a dynamic instrument and it has to move with times. So if you have this as a basis, here comes our problem called constitutional silence. When you have to do the third part, the role of a court in not overstretching 
at the same time occupying and doing something meaningful how can a court or officers of the court like us do that when should we do that and how should we do that what are the limitations in doing that this is all governed by what is called as constitutional silences which is the topic for today's discussion clear so far to all of you any questions now uh, till now can you progress to the next stage all right so what do you mean by constitutional silence lawrence tribe you should i think our library will have that book it's it's a wonderful piece wonderful piece which whenever you find time you should go through it will simply inspire you one of the greatest writers in the us now he brings out the science of constitutional silence of course it's an american thought no doubt about it but has a lot of relevance and significance even in an indian context now he catalogs four to five principles of understanding in a in a scientific sense what would constitute a constitutional silence when does it become a constitutional silence number 1 he says every judge and every court and every council or whoever is connected with the constitution and its interpretation first should find out whether it is a case of a silence or a case of avoidance that's the first step one has to take in dealing with a situation of constitutional silence whether it was intended to be avoided or it has slipped into slumber or silence that's the first effort a court has to make because he says if something has to be avoided if the intention if the circumstances throw open an avenue of interpretation to show that this was intended to be avoided even though not couched in words and expressions then you can't read that as a constitutional silence then progress further by giving impregnating it with an interpretation when they have intended this to be part not part of the scheme don't introduce it as a part of the scheme by saying no no this is silent and therefore we will read silence as something which is intended no don't do that so there must be a clear analysis an inference out of that analysis that this is a case which does not fall within the domain of avoidance it therefore falls within the domain of silence requiring an attention of the court for a meaningful interpretation this is the first step one has to do in the exercise whenever you get into the zone first test now the second test which he says he recommends is once you are convinced it is not avoidance but a silence then spend time and assimilate the silence independently don't be influenced by factors don't be influenced by the surrounding circumstances don't do that don't reach out you can reach out to understand whether it is silent once you have come to the conclusion it is a case of silence then in isolation assimilate that silence why that silence why when when after all it's a written institute it is a constitution is a written document in india when somebody has written a constitution with 395 articles and 12 schedules why have they missed this out why have they not incorporated it therefore assimilate 
the silence. It's a silence and why at all? He says, if you assimilate the silence independently, it will throw you a contextual light. It will lead you to an inference which will help you to give a meaningful interpretation to it. Don't do it with the surrounding circumstances. Don't do uh, zigzag. Don't hop. Don't fly. No, don't do all that. Do it in an, as an independent exercise. So this is the second recommendation he makes when you reach the zone of silence. Now the third, very interesting. It's a very nice, see how clinically people think. It's, it's, a, it's a masterly work. You should read it. Now third he says, like sounds. See, sounds come in various varieties. We see life in various colors. Each one of you are so beautifully dressed in multicolors. Standing from here watching you. It's a feast. So nice. So colors are multiple. Perceptions are multiple. Sounds multiple. Voices multiple. So you have shades. You have varieties in sounds. Please understand, silence also come in varieties. That's the third caution he utters. Because it is a silence, don't think it has only one form. And don't conclude it, it can be interpreted only through one tool of interpretation. No. Don't straitjacket yourself. Don't limit yourself that way. That's the third caution he utters. When you reach the zone of silence, like sounds, like colors, like we see life with varieties. Have a broad-minded thought process to assimilate that this silence can be of a variety A in contrast to some other silence in the same constitution at a different uh, uh, context as uh, a B. So, silence can get reflected as, as, we, as we cited a few minutes before, mothers nod, mothers grin, mothers frown, mothers anxiety, mothers compassion. You see mother in any form, it's only divine, without a doubt. Now you see her in so many forms and you see her in so many forms of divinity. It's possible. Similarly, silence also comes in various forms. So this is one aspect which you should, we, you should not get stuck saying that, after all, we read one silence in a particular way in some other provision. So that it does not appear to be here. And therefore, it is not as a, no, don't do that. Allow it to flow its way. It will lead you. So assimilation requires you to put this effect. Don't limit yourself. Allow it to expand. This is the third uh, 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 principle one should follow in reading a constitutional silence. Now the fourth. This is a basic uh, requirement uh, in any proposition, in any interpretative exercise. It applies also to silence. See, as lawyers, when you profess a point before a court of law, and as a judge, somebody decides it, one thing should be present and one thing should certainly be eliminated. Whatever you do must be on an objective criteria. See, you will always be pitted with these two opposite forces when you interpret law. Objective criteria and subjective satisfaction. These are the two terminologies. You will have to bear it in mind. It should be part of your vein. It should be part of your blood system. Whenever you analyze something, you should be free from subjectivity. A subjective analysis is always very, very shallow and relative. Because it is based on personal preferences. Whereas an objective analysis 
is diverse of emotions diverse of passions it is it will give you the sense of truth and allow truth to stare at you so even if you work a case for your client you may have to defend it finally is a different story but when you analyze the case you must apply the objective test and not the subjective test a subjective test is a relative test an objective test is a perfect test so he recommends in interpreting a silence there is simply no room for subjectivity if you allow subjectivity to interfere then lot of discretion will get packaged into it when discretion gets packaged into it then it becomes your personal reasoning it doesn't become a legal reasoning and therefore you may go off tangent off target so the fourth criteria is objective satisfaction and not subjective satisfaction now the fifth one the last he recommends the legal culture of a country is a caution he utters the legal culture of a country is contingent upon how it values the constitutional silences and how it progressively interprets the silence so this is the final criteria this is what exactly what uh, uh, justice marshall also said don't have any fears if you need to step in to fill in the vacuum or the gap you should not hesitate you should step in and you should fill it up if you don't do that if you stay back saying that no no it's not obvious it's not very clear so let me stay away this is not my job this is not court's job this is not lawyer's job it's all only parliament which has to do all that then you won't enter the era of progressive legal culture the standardization and the growth of a legal system is contingent upon how effectively it interprets silences in the constitution now these are the five major criteria or guidelines he puts it in deciding what constitutional silences are then he comes down to say what are the types of constitutional silences we have now seen the criteria in assessing a silence he now comes down to say what will be the criteria the various types of silences he classifies them broadly into three four buckets interesting interesting classification the first one he says door closing silence versus door opening silence nice terminologies it fascinates when you read it i am going to talk on this federalism subject based on this you have today a nine judge bench judgment in the ratio of 7 is to 2 seven following door closing option and the minority two following the door opening option in interpreting constitutional silence i'll come to that little later so two criteria are very important to 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 the first uh, the, the the types of silences he classifies the first to be door closing versus door opening silences now what do you mean by door closing and door opening this is something similar to avoidance and silence similar but he puts it with better clarity here says is it unintended lapse or was it intentionally not put into the article if it is unintentional then he says use the tool of opening the door he recommends 
employing the principle of door opening silence and allow the silence to be interpreted but if it is not an intentional lapse it was actually intended not to be there if you are able to gather the inference from the context in which it is put or in which it is absent then he says you employ the door closing option don't allow the lid to be open then you will be entering the terrain of a misinterpreted path not recommended so this is one type now the second type he classifies it as structural silence versus individual silence that's the second category what do you mean by a structural silence and individual silence he says find out whether this category of silence is something to do with the structure of the constitution then you have to be very careful in reading the doctrine of silence there on the contrary if you find this to be something to deal with liberties rights duties responsibilities of individuals then you can be little more tolerant you can be little more expansive you can be little more flexible in your uh, in in carrying out the interpretation through that silence in a meaningful way so he classifies the constitutional silence broadly into two and it's very important to highlight we in india have followed the and implemented the interpretative skills of constitutional silences in both these domains both in structural silence and also in individual silences your basic structure document which i'll deal it in in a short while basic structure document even according to fali nariman in his article emanates out of constitutional silence you don't find anything like basic structure in the constitution it has come only through an interpretation in keshavananda bharti's case not before that so structural silence the direct example we have in india is the basic structure when it comes to individual silences the direct example we have is the ever expanding uh, scope of article 21 under the constitution on the aspect of life and liberty i think nothing is left out under this sun to say you are not entitled to hereafter there's a very interesting migration which i want to touch upon for a few minutes today why did it was puzzling me how could article 21 from ak gopalan reach a state where we are now saying noise free pollution free everything should be pure to you and you can demand it through a court order is simply not possible so there is an interesting twist which has taken place between part 3 and part 4 of the constitution through the operation of this public interest litigations i'm going to touch on that for a short while how silence has it is not interpreting or exploring silence it is explosion of silence in the area of article 21 so individual silences you have structural silence versus the individual silence second category now we come to the third category it is not a type he says the difference between a constitutional silence and silences in any other form of life he utters a caution the discretion has to be between personal passion and be neutral in interpreting the silence never allow your personal agenda to flow into areas where you find constitution is silent 
because your personal agenda is an aggregation of your personal passion it's an aggregation of your personal experiences which may be awful for a wonderful for b neutral for c irritating for d aggressive for e joy and action packed for f so each one carries with them their own uh, accumulate accumulation of experiences that can't form a basis in interpreting a constitutional silence see this is the biggest challenge today in courts with media exposing everything under the sun media doing the trial media doing the case you have the biggest threat you don't allow constitution to be interpreted as how it was intended by the makers you have only two limitations in interpreting a constitution you must interpret what they intended refer to the debates refer to whatever it is then if you find that there is a lacuna point out that lacuna and allow parliament to amend it now the second doesn't happen at all you keep stuffing the constitution with each one's interpretative skill a socialist judge reads the constitution from a socialistic pattern a judge who believes in who is a voter of free trade and capitalism and progress as a free enterprise reads the constitution with a lot of freedoms and liberties somebody who has deep sense of attachment to communistic thoughts they read the constitution in a different angle somebody who is a voter of women's right read the whole constitution to be meant only for women so the same document when it passes through different people and texture gives rise to different interpretations same truth you will now find that is happening in courts you argue a case before a bench and for some reason after hearing it gets adjourned it goes before a different bench after 6 months you argue the same point the judges don't reflect the same view same case it goes before different benches each bench understands and views the case from its own backdrop so it's not something is because human thought human mind is has multiple uh, cap- capabilities of assimilation so he utters a, con- a caution please be careful when you interpret a constitution you should interpret the constitution as it is intended for don't interpret the constitution the way you understand it it should be no no i see constitution to be like this and therefore i will no you have no choice you have simply no choice see what it says and interpret what it intended to be that is all the role of a judge and the role of a counsel in progressing with a matter under the constitution so he says it very clearly personal passions emotions personal experiences personal inflictions personal hurt personal feelings cannot influence in interpreting a constitutional silence this far clear any questions right now we will see three examples of this constitutional silence and then i'll take up some questions if you want and then we will wind up i promise you three basic structure article 21 and now the new found concern called federalism let's take basic structure Mr. Nariman in his article very clearly brings out a nice passage which I will read it to you. He says, "All of you know, Keshavananda Bharati was a judgment which was heard by the longest bench and for the longest period of time, thirteen learned judges heard the matter for months together before they could deliver, 
and many say it is a 6 is to 6 is to 1 and therefore it became 7 is to 6 <laughs> uh, which way the 7 is uh, what the uh, ruling roost is the basic structure has come to stay you have to read it from say Shankri Prasad, Sajan Singh, Golaknath, progressively various judgments. There are five Pancharatnas, five judgments, the last being Keshavananda Bharati. Now, you don't find the terminology basic structure anywhere in the constitution. It's not there. So when 13 judges heard and multiple opinions were expressed and virtually divided as six is to six. It is Justice Kanna's opinion which tilted the scales in the case of the Bharti judgment. Justice Khanna, it was Justice Kanna who introduced this theory saying that we will not be, uh, um, I mean, uh, amputing you the power of amendments. You can amend, but Parliament has got a power to amend, no doubt, but not the basic structure. So it came through his judgment, which tilted the scales whether you can amend and if so, to what extent. He drew the outer parameter, saying that you can't amend the basic structure. In fact, uh, I will read that interesting passage as how uh, uh, Nariman brings it out in his article. This is what he says. The great Justice Kanna, I always call him, Kanna J held that the power of the amendment under Article 368 was plenary. That it included the power to amend various articles of the Constitution and was not fettered by any provision in part 3, the fundamental rights chapter. That no fundamental right, only because it was fundamental right, could claim immunity from the amending process. And that the power to amend included within itself the power to add, alter, or repeal the various articles of the Constitution. But, and Nariman writes, with a capital but, B-U-T, he also held. And this is now the ratio in fundamental rights case 5, that the power to amend Article 368, wide as it was, did not include the power to abrogate the constitution, or to alter its basic structure, or framework, hence the doctrine of basic structure. So, these words brought a new doctrine called Basics. 368 doesn't use this word anywhere. It doesn't limit the amending power in that manner. So, it came through a constitutional interpretation. Now, the question is, why did they interpret it so? In fact, interestingly, the article progresses to say, even though it was found in Keshavananda Bharti's case, basic doctrine, basic structure doctrine would have been given a decent burial in the next few years. But for the two later amendments, 39th amendment and the 42nd amendment, which resulted in the Rajnarayan's case and the Minerva Mills case. What we popularly call the election case of uh, uh, Madam Indira Gandhi. So, these two judgments brought to light the basic fear that a majoritarian government in power can brutally amend the constitution to any extent, even contrary to the interest of the majoritarian votes. Not, not taking into account the holistic uh, India. So, if you simply have numbers in the parliament and numbers of the same party in the state assemblies, then you can virtually rip the constitution the way you want. That was the amending power under 368. 
so they decided this is dangerous for anybody so they made it very clear you can't touch or corrode the basic structure judicial review is a basic structure you can't remove the power of judicial review except for that nine schedule article that's that's a different story even there uh, wideness can be tested there so you have to be very clear about basic this is how basic structure has emerged out out of necessity it sustained it breathed it breathed life and it is even today respected only because your njec judgment is another reason recent judgment when when there's a fear that one of the constitutional organs is now made to be submissive to the will of the executive governance is it so which is not forming part of the basic structure and therefore it corrodes and therefore a constitutional bench judgment so basic structure doctrine is a doctrine which emerged out of constitutional silence now we take the second one article 21 right to life and liberty in fact both me and amrit we are talking about that in the morning we share the same concern and the same views on this if you read lawrence tribe's articles the growth of american jurisprudence over a period of time over centuries has been only in the area of human rights a society which was obsessed about human rights i should say now human rights alone is not life sustaining human rights alone is not law law life and society has several facets including one of them being human rights so if a society starts progressing starts meditating starts contemplating starts focusing only on nurturing human rights you will finally end up where usa today is family structure is gone social structure is gone individuals are gripped with a, a mental and physical disorders man eats man no sense no ethics no morality and you still chase and respect it as the world's largest democracy world's most powerful democracy which is true so obsession over individual rights obsession over human rights can lead you can lead a society into trouble this is the moral which all of you should carry please there are enough people in this domain so when you become uh, public intellectuals great lawyers there are several other areas on which you each one if you can concentrate and add value to the society and add value to yourself don't be obsessed about human rights uh, all human beings are capable of uh, nurturing their rights we have all developed to that level don't have any fears there too much of work has been done and uh, too much of focus on attention and therefore it is becoming a digression that's the truth now i hope you'll share the same view <laughs> the professor is laughing at me i don't know whether i'm right or wrong but well this is what we see at least as a matter of uh, concern okay let's see what happened in article 21 very interesting sir part 3 guarantees you fundamental rights which is justiciable which is enforceable through a court process all of you understand part 3 when you say an enforceable fundamental right what do you mean if if it, it doesn't happen to you you can go to a court of law and say please enforce it my rights are getting perish you can go to a court of law and get something your way that's the assurance given to you in part 3 as fundamental rights nobody can take that away under any 
definitive circumstances any uh, uh, say absolutely innocuous whatever may be adverse circumstances this rights cannot peri cannot perish or cannot be eclipsed right part 4 of the constitution deals with fundamental duties of a state if you read that very carefully these are all nice egalitarian ideas which a state shall endeavor to achieve and part 4 very clearly says one of the articles 37 or 38 very clearly says these duties are not justiciable you can't go to a court of law and enforce saying that constitution has said this is a fundamental duty ask the state to perform this fundamental duty you can go and insist it's not possible the constitution itself prohibits it now interestingly whatever is conceived as constitutional duties in part 4 the last 20 years one after the other has slowly slipped seeped into article 21 it's a beautiful route you should read it you when you work on it it's i i had i never did a public interest litigation in my life of course we are we are doing a few now that is more on corporate war rather than a real public interest litigation they are private interest litigations made into public which are fighting it in the various courts including supreme court so i never had an occasion but i had to deliver a talk in ngec and therefore i read this and this is my assessment what you could not do through part 4 because there is a constitutional bar slowly you migrate this for example delhi winter writ petition is filed all everybody on the road should be given sweaters should be given proper shawls should be given proper shelter noble thought without a doubt noble thought but how many are indians how many have proper citizenship rights nobody has any statistics so everybody so you file a writ petition then enforce it a state shall endeavor the best of li- livelihood for a citizen is okay now what has become lively right to life includes right to livelihood migrated from part 4 to part 3 noise free a blaring speaker every day you file a writ petition decibels are all gone my ears are all gone you should stop writ petition is filed enforced water problem sanitation problem all problems of a corporation is now put into public interest litigation and whether corporation has resources whether it has the means whether it has a time schedule whether it's part of the priority no you dictate the court to run the corporation very recently interestingly two judges have to decide the most auspicious day for a temple kumbhabhishekam i think the worst that can happen <laughs> and they all become a, so you leave, you don't you don't uh, uh, have faith on your astrologers why because two astrologers are giving two dates so two groups one group says it has to be performed on date a another group says no date b this astrologer is superior so both astrologers fight how do you get resolved you go to the court and two judges have to decide which of the two astrologers right they will i think toss the coin inside the cabin and decide whichever heads or tails will what can they do this is a science of its own nature so you push you now involve courts into everything and you keep in fact in one of the sessions 6 8 months back when i had an occasion to uh, uh, talk to the high court judges what are the reasons of pendency i catalog 8 to 9 reasons in which judiciary was uh, uh, was completely now uh, judiciary is inflicted with burden and now people say judiciary is not doing its job one of the main reasons are executive governance if it does its job properly and don't burden matters to the courts your pendency will come down by 90% because today the major litigant 
in the country is the executive either as a petitioner or as a respondent and most of the orders passed by the courts are not followed or not implemented by the executive starting from the police take anybody contempt proceedings more only often more often only against against the government officers so these are all you keep burdening the executive arm things which are only conceived as duties which they have to perform are now compelled and read into article 21 as fundamental rights the list is endless i'll just read you see right to live includes right to livelihood preservation of life through medical care right to privacy right to reputation right to breathe unpolluted air prevention of noise pollution keep reading everything so this is an area where it is not a constitutional silence it's an explosion of a constitutional silence basic structure understandable individual liberties reading every liberty into article 21 is not a right trend it doesn't gel with our value system our traditions and our democratic uh, process if we start aping the west and especially following the us we will finally crumble somewhere silence has to have a limitation under article 21 now we come to the last one namely federalism just spend a few minutes and then 10 to 15 minutes some more time you're all feeling tired say you're all okay we can't do that with judges at least i can do it with students <laughs> when you go on and on and on eh? <laughs> but the art lies only there you should go on and on and on <laughs> irrespective of whether the judge listens to you or not <laughs> you should make him listen the skill lies there good how many of you want to take to litigation why oh my god hardly i see i give you one more i give you five, two more minutes how many want you to be in litigation <laughs> what is wrong you just left <laughs> mm why why rest of them are not inclined in litigation what are the downsides in opting out for litigation say me two two reasons why you should not be a litigator come on ah uh, one then takes too much time two finances in fact uh, both these things are now fairly streamlined the law firms and even individuals are compensating you reasonably well do not it may match with the corporate compensation it matches almost similar to corporate compensation and uh, a structure is now getting into place even in professional litigative practice as you have it in the jobs in your employment opportunity and therefore those two things which which bother you may not be present as it was earlier so if that is the botheration you can have a, a rethink and more people all of you straight away don't aspire not necessarily you should be a high court lawyer or a supreme court lawyer not necessary there is enough practice happening in mufsil areas where people need uh, good support good lawyers to do good cases and good cases when done by good counsels will result in good judges coming slowly it's a cyclic process so a lot of support is needed at the district level also it's crumbling the system is otherwise crumbling at the district and the lower court levels nothing is happening worthwhile so it's one area where you should think of 
occupying the place where you can make a very decent living and still fulfill your obligations as a lawyer to the society if possible just consider yourself right now we come to federal 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 system uh, federalism see this is what i wanted to say <clears throat> this nine judge bench uh, judgment in entry tax it laid down two principles one on tax and another on federalism i would not like to tax uh, talk on the tax piece today because we have the nani palki wala mood coming up the first week of april and we are all part of the judging panel so whatever i say should not be conceived as uh, my view on the subject matter so i would refrain myself from talking about it on the tax piece let me wait for the finals and after the finals is over let me try to tell you how the judgment is right or wrong from our own perceptions now there is a more concerning perspective this judgment has delivered which according to me is very important and very significant all of us know india is a federal india has a federal setup of governance and what do you mean by a federal setup in contrast to a unitary setup most of the countries in the european union are a unitary setup single government for the whole nation whereas in india we don't have a single government for the whole nation the nation has a central government and every state has its own government called a state government so your powers are shared and divided by two forces the union forces and the provincial forces or the state forces this is how the country is designed it has a historical reason as we said when we became independent in 1947 we had to inherit the british colonial past and the princely states and we need to integrate all of them so it was not a in easy task to achieve a unified india one indian unitary state was an impossible dream so states were classified on linguistic basis geographical basis and ever so many other criteria were placed when states were finally formed so the constitutional makers conceived our nation to be a federal country and that's flowing from part 11 of the constitution article 245 and 246 very clearly and uh, and the following article subsequent articles very clearly uh, uh, depict india to be a federal state there's no confusion about it now these are the guidelines laid down by the supreme court in bombay's judgment it says the expression federalism and secularism is not something which is defined in the constitution India is a federal thought its federal country is no doubt but what is a federalism is not in a definition form in the constitution so it says in bombay's judgment only courts are empowered to define what is federal in nature and what is secular in nature our tv anchors can't be defining federalism or <laughs> secularism and what they define is not what secularism need to be let's understand these are all individual views the constitution guarantees this obligation only through the courts especially constitutional courts namely high court and the supreme court and the supreme court is the final arbiter under article 145 so we must be guided only by that thought process right then what has supreme court said why india is a federal country it has given reasons why we call ourselves to be a federal setup a you have two governments in place the settled government and the state government b you have three lists this is something which we have inherited from the government of india act you have three lists list 1 list 2 and list 3 list 1 and list 2 
these are all powers to be exercised exclusively by the parliament in the case of list 1 and exclusively by the state legislature in the case of list 2 so legislative powers are earmarked between the state and the center and therefore we are federal in nature states have their own right to enact laws in certain domains defined in list 2 center has definitive powers to draft laws in its areas defined under list 1 and state cannot transgress into center's powers and center cannot transgress into state powers and therefore india is a federal country very important now you also have a concurrent list which is list 3 where both can legislate have power to legislate and in case of any inconsistency the state has to yield to the center it's a third third type of dispensation so parallel powers concurrent powers but one has to yield to the other to ensure there is no conflict and there is an exception in the constitution itself it says the state has to yield to the center but there is an exception to that what are the exception if the state can take it to the president and if the president can validate it saying that no this state legislation for these peculiar reasons should stay if he validates it then the constitution says for that state alone that state law will apply and not the central law and central law will apply for rest of the provinces this is there in the constitution itself normal rule is to yield abnormal uh, situation is an exception when president gives validates no no the state is empowered to follow its own law in a given circumstances falling under list 3 and therefore india is a federal country very interestingly when when i would do one session on gst whenever the appropriate time comes today we have progressed to a era from list 1 list 2 list 3 to a beautiful uh, progression where you have created a new article called article 246 capital a simultaneous exercise of power by union and states in a gst regime the gst levy is not a concurrent levy please don't assume it to be your all lawyer people will put anything in the press don't believe all that you are all lawyers you have to understand it correctly GST levy is not falling under the concurrent list even though power to tax is both the union and the center this is one legislation where the power and the list both are packaged in the article itself article 246 capital a says both the union and the state government shall impose a GST so the levy called gst and the partners who will impose the levy namely the union and the state both are conceived together in article 246 capital a and therefore india is a federal country now the point is the flash point is this this is what justice Boma, i mean uh, sr bobai judgment says even though both have the right to make power laws the power to enact laws the powers are not symmetrical in nature the powers are asymmetrical that's exactly the expression used in bobai's judgment so even though union and state exercise powers the powers are not symmetrical but asymmetrical in nature and it therefore concludes because powers are asymmetric asymmetrical in nature even though india is a federal country it still leans more towards the center so we lean towards a centric form of federalism and not a state form of federalism nine judges unanimously have held it so now what has this bench of nine what has it done 
a bench of equal strength has virtually upset it Bombay's judgment. For the first time, this judgment says we will empower states more and progress through a new era called a state-centric federalism. How do they do it and what do they do? What do, what do we, mean? we mean by from moving away from leaning towards the center, you empower the states more. What does it mean under the constitutional setup? See, this is what it means. Both the governor of a state and president of the country is vested with certain powers under the constitution. Powers of approval, ratification, validation, consideration, consent, different types of powers, six to seven types of powers are conceived under the constitution and these are vested with the governors and the president. And uh, the act for and on behalf of the central government, the constitutional bench judgment has already said, acting through the governor or president is acting, is nothing but the central government. He represents the central government ultimately in exercise of these powers. Now, 70 years the law was before this judgment came to be reversed. 70 years the judgment said part 13 which talks about economic unity. Part 13 is one interesting chapter in the constitution which is non-federalistic in its thought process to begin with. It says we are conceiving a borderless India. It says there are no state barriers in economics and commerce and trade. It says, can even though we are a pluralistic society, even though we are a federalistic setup, can we dream and conceive of one unified economic India? These are the seeds sown in part 13. And it therefore said, Whenever you impose both tax restrictions or non-tax restrictions while carrying trade intercy between the states, should, you, should any state impose any restriction, tax or non-tax restriction, it requires a presidential approval. For example, can you move your lorry after 10 p.m. into your state crossing the uh, check post? You put onerous conditions for that, it requires presidential approval. Can you tax 40% when goods are taxed at 20% in the neighboring states? You want to make your state consume more of your products. You don't want neighboring states to sell your products. What we call it parochial patriotism requires presidential approval. This is the law for 70 years. Now this judgment says nothing doing. If state is competent to exercise its powers under list two and impose a tax, it has a right to impose a tax, then that right has to be retained in an unfettered manner. President cannot interfere. We can't read presidential approval as a condition mandatory in imposing a tax restriction. And they applied the doctrine of silence to do so. They said, constitution is silent about it. We will read a meaning into that silence and we will open up the lid. 70 years, president has been exercising that power. President need not exercise that power. He will exercise it only for non-tax restriction. For getting a check post clearance, you need presidential approval. But you want to impose 50% more tax, you don't require a presidential approval. That's exactly what the majority says, quite interestingly. And what is the reason? The concern is this. The majority now says, wherever there is an unfettered right to legislate by the states in list two, two, then the right shall remain unfettered in the constitution. You don't require a presidential approval there. 
you can't read a restriction in that manner allowing the president to monitor that and give it because we want to empower states with more powers so this is the first trend setting judgment first doubt we all of us have is how can a bench of equal strength come to a different view when nine judges in bombay have in unambiguous terms said we are a federal setup but we lean towards the center how can now you lean towards the state this is one one concern can therefore now you have two conflicting views of bench of equal strength now how did this happen that is important the majority applied the door closing silence doctrine and said we will shut the door we will read this silence to be something which empowers which does not empower the president to approve now tribe says a door closing silence what will be the interpretative tool the interpretative tool will be two a it will be textual interpretation and it will be a literal interpretation so the tool for a door closing silence is textual and literal interpretation whereas the minority which was authored by his lordship justice dr chandrachur said we are not going to stick with textual interpretation we want to apply the contextual interpretation so it was clearly uh, a division of views between textual interpretation vis-a-vis -vis contextual interpretation the minority chose contextual interpretation and what is the a tool of interpretation when it is contextual it is purposeful and progressive interpretation textual interpretation leads to literal interpretation contextual interpretation leads to progressive and purposive interpretation this is the significant difference which emerged in two strong views in this nine judgment and in the process we have now reached a flash point what do we do by arming the states with more power i'll conclude with this we are a federal country with a lean we leaning towards the center for the simple reason we have one single constitution unlike usa unlike brazil where each state has its own constitution we have a single constitution we have a single citizenship we have one supreme court with judgments binds the whole country we have one article 3 311 we have one ias cadre a common all india civil services we have one cag there are 15 20 such aspects in the constitution which without ambiguity point out to the fact that we need to lean towards the center even though we are a federal setup on the contrary countries which have had state centric federalism because of multiple constitution multiple citizenship multiple rights globally they have experienced the following a people with regionalistic thoughts start occupying center stage that's the first dangerous trend if you are going to be state centric federal setup people with regional feelings will occupy the center stage first two between things of national importance and state importance things of state importance will start gaining prominence at the national stage especially in a coalition era if you have a coalition government the government which has the maximum numbers will drive its agenda its feelings its priorities of its state as the priorities of the center and three more importantly it leads to 
secessionist, secessionist tendencies in, in remote cases. This is the greatest concern. In fact, uh, uh, Justice Nariman, in his second speech on the state legislative powers, brings out a beautiful distinction in the Constitution between Jammu and Kashmir and rest of the part of India in its constitutional setup. Rest of India is governed by only one constitution. Whereas Jammu and Kashmir has a separate constitution which this president will promulgate and allow the, that particular state to follow. So, you have an independent constitution for historical reasons in Jammu and Kashmir. You don't have that in India. Just because you have an independent constitution and certain independent rights and assertions, 70 years, what are we now facing? History is revealing its own views on that. So, when Bombay says India is one, even though it is federal in the form of governance, India is one. Let us preserve the oneness because we are one Indians, we are one citizenship and therefore lean towards the center. Now you upset that by saying, no, no, states are more empowered. We will slowly dilute governors and president's powers over a period of time. Are we creating these same tendencies outside Jammu and Kashmir into other parts of India? This is something, as law students, you should research. I want you to do this as a research paper. We should all work towards it. Prepare and give a docu document uh, to the government of India saying that what do we gain by leaning towards union and what do we lose by moving away from the union and be by becoming more empowered. Tax is just a fiscal issue. There are more concerning social, economic and other political issues, especially secessionation of territories. See, States, you can, you can modify territories, you can realign territories, you can reorganize states, you can create states, you can create smaller states. It's all possible under the constitution, but you can't concede one inch of land out of Bharat to somebody else. It doesn't empower you to do so. Any parliament cannot do that. So when this is so, the tendency to separate, the tendency to activate secessionist movement gets spearheaded if you are going to be, if you are going to empower states with more power, Jammu and Kashmir is one such example. In, in the, so, Jammu and Kashmir is a two federal, two federal system because it's a constitution of its own. In fact, uh, uh, there, is a, there is a judgment, state of West Bengal versus Union of India by the constitutional bench, Justice ja, Das has, is, the, is the leading uh, one who, who wrote the judgment. He says, what is true federalism? A, that particular state must have a constitution of its own, like Brazil or USC. Two, any amendment concerning it, it must have the right to say whether it an amendment will go through or not. Three, it must have one national security, integrity and treatise. And four, one Supreme Court or High Courts to decide the law as whether it is uh, valid or not. Justice Das says, third and fourth get satisfied in India, but one and two doesn't get satisfied because we are governed by a single constitution and we don't have the right to see territories, except in the case of Anjamun and Kashmir. That's the only exception. So, this judgment does, uh, is concerning and of course, there is no finality in law. In fact, the judges, the majority, while concluding, says, we, we think, we also feel that this may not rest here and it can move on. Especially when there are two conflicting views of nine judges. We only hope one day all of us, including yourself, will have the opportunity to stand before 11 judges to revisit the subject and enforce the Bomai doctrine is right law in this land. And the same has to be upheld. It was a pleasure to have spoken to you uh, for all this time. <laughs> want a, a couple of questions I can take if you want, and, or else I can say goodbye to all of you. It's a pleasure. I'm looking forward to meeting you all in, on April 8th and 9th. I'll be here to 
for the Palkiwala boot competition. Got any questions you can ask? Five, ten minutes, sir. Your time. Thank you, sir, for this wonderful lecture. I gained good knowledge about what constitutional silence means. I didn't have any idea that this is what you are supposed to talk about, but I got a good approach to it. It is meta-constitution, if I'm not in mistake. Huh? It is uh, unwritten part of a written constitution. That is Perfect. what you're talking about, right? So anyway, I have three questions. I don't know how many I'm allowed. So can I ask you? You, you are allowed? <laughs> See, okay. he has said you are allowed. Okay. We, so, uh, Supreme first, Court, we can't overrule it. <laughs> so, go ahead. So, uh, I'll state two facts and ask my question. The first fact is that uh, John Adams, former US president, said that uh, the constitution should be changed every decade so as to suit each generation. I don't know if he did for uh, getting political support from the Confederates, but he said that. Second one is that Sri Lanka had changed its constitution five times. So the question is purely academically speaking, in your opinion, does the constitution hold a silence with respect to the remaking of the constitution? So that's my question number one. Question number two is this, uh, can there be a jurisprudential approach wherein the right to perform one's fundamental duties be, by virtue of any constitutional silence, be a fundamental right? And, and third one is with respect to federalism. For example, section 494 of IPC, which talks about bigamy, uh, Andhra Pradesh alone has a state amendment making it a non-madeable and cognizable offense, whereas in the rest of the states it's not so. I don't know if it has received presidential assent or not, whether that is violative of Article 14 or not. Bigamy, eh? Not by Gami. Uh, it, <laughs> it's it violative is, of every law. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I'm asking that uh, if a person in Tamil Nadu commits by Gami, it is a. That's right. That's it, it, you understand what I'm trying to I say? I understand. Right? I understand. Uh, Good. Okay. I'll take the last question first because that's the easiest. <clears throat> Whatever happens to the law, as law students, let's be very clear it's just not immoral, it is simply intolerance. So, bigamy in any form, can, whether it is punishable or not, never even conceive it as part of uh, a thought process. Of course, you are as lawyers, we are entitled to think from the legal perspective, but it is simply, simply, you can't divide your time and attention to more than one whom you can love the most in your life. I am talking it from an emotional sense, not from a legal sense. Okay? But, uh, yeah, the discretion is when, see, it's like this. When discretion is vested with state, empower, state uh, exercise of power, a state chooses to exercise and some other state does not choose to exercise. You can't therefore say, I should have belonged to that state and I will still get, get away. Whereas in some other state, I think that's not an answer. That's not an answer. It only shows the state has not been careful enough in using its discretion. A, a wrong cannot make something right for somebody else. That's, that's even at a moral level, I think it is a sustainable point. Now coming to your first two questions. Whether we should amend the constitution once in 10 years, you don't have to amend it. If you see, that, that's, that's exactly uh, the role of constitutional silences. All our judgments, without any exception, declare that constitution is a live document because it deals with society and social feelings, societal thoughts. Therefore, the society, how it exists today, will form the basis for its interpretation. 50, 70 years back, gay sex would have been shunned out in courts, even at the admission level. Today we are trying to talk of bringing a law and legitimizing it so that uh, individual rights and liberties are preserved. So how do you read this? You have not amended uh, any provision of the constitution for that matter. You don't have to do that. You can read and impregnate it if you want. In 1958, when RMDC judgment was delivered by Justice Vivian Bose, he made it very clear, gambling is evil and cites from the Rig Vedas. 
judgment uh, extracts from Rig Vedas by Justice Vivian Bose. In 2010, two judges of the Supreme Court in Kushbu's case says, living together is not immoral. See the shift from 1960 to 2010 over a period of 50 years in our social thought process. So, this, is, this, is happen, this has happened in US, it is happening everywhere else. It is also happening in India. We are therefore capable of adapting ourselves through the interpretative road in sustaining what is good and what needs to be part of the system. I wouldn't say every time what is good. Now we, are, we have a tendency to move towards whatever society does, we should accept it and make it into a law rather than telling them what you do is not correct. Courts are no longer doing the role of assertion. They are playing with the societal thoughts and say, well, these are all private rights. These are all individual liberties. We can't be giving our lectures or discourses on all these subjects. When five judges in RMDC have said gambling is an evil, drinking is an evil, don't do it. It says in a judgment. Today they say, no, no, it's all personal habits. We can't be interfering into that. So, whether it's good or bad, one school of thought says it's bad. One school of thought says it is good. That is what we were debating in the morning. A country which is obsessed about individual rights will go to ruin one day or the other. We can't allow this to happen. It's going beyond the limits of tolerance. This is my personal view. Answer to your question, you will see <coughs> constitution being interpreted dynamically based on the social setup and cases that it comes before it at that point of time. Now, what was the second question? Can there be a jurisprudential approach wherein the right to perform one's fundamental duties under the constitution can be declared as a fundamental right no. by virtue of constitutional silence? No, this is what uh, article, the explosion of article 21, I spoke on that. What was certain, see, sometimes courts are right in admitting public interest litigation because executive inertia, they need to be handled. But sometimes, in the name of trying to be a judicial activist, you are actually burdening the executive, which it, in a given circumstances may not be even able to perform. So the, the lines which are drawn by the constitution between duties and rights is slowly getting blurred. And duties are all migrating into rights. And that's a dangerous trend. My personal view. Any one question? Good morning, yeah. sir. Uh, my one, question... One, only one question. Yes, only one question. Okay, good. So but in three parts. <laughs> no, single question. Okay, okay. So, if I'm not wrong, sir, you equated objectivity with the intention of the founding fathers. Yes. So, in that case, uh, there's a possibility that the understanding of the founding fathers themselves, a hypothetical situation, this is uh, even uh, Jurgen Habermas speaks about it in his deconstruction of hermeneutics. In his deconstruction of hermeneutics, uh, even Jurgen Habermas actually questions this uh, idea that the idea ideals as expressed by the founding fathers are the right way to interpret a particular uh, system of thought or a particular provision of the constitution. He says that there's a possibility of the founding fathers themselves having uh, got the idea as a result of a systematic distortion which could have happened for thousands of years. Answer is, see, good, good, I think it's a very... Sen yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And one more point, sir, not a question. Uh, this was actually, you, you raised a point about obsessions with uh, human rights, that it leads to degradation of uh, human life. But uh, it was actually dealt by uh, Mr. Chomsky in one of his books. He says that it, this is not actually a reason, uh, uh, this is not a consequence of uh, drive towards human rights, but actually it is a consequence of neoliberalism. That neoliberalism and human right movements had a fight, and that at the end neoliberalism won out, with leaving uh, us in this degraded state. Correct, correct, correct. See, in fact, there is no disagreement with your question. The answer is this. Whether the, the founding fathers uh, were right or wrong, 
is something which we can keep debating at every point of time. But what is recommended is, this is what Nariman also says, the Constitutional Assembly of 1946 was more neutral or more sensible than the society which wants constitution to be interpreted in a particular way today. That's the reality. They have been more neutral and sensible. So you factor two, two limitations with you. Go by what the constitution says which they have brought it out. If you find them to be inadequate, point out and allow the parliament to do. See, that's what they did it in gay sex. Supreme Court said, why should two judges decide this law? If all of you feel that it's a liberty to be preserved and nurtured and protected and has to be patronized, let there be a legislation by the parliament. Let them amend the IPC. That's the way. Because in a democratic setup, we believe the voice of the people, the voice of the citizens are rooted through the legislators. So, you highlight what is the lacuna in fulfilling their objectives but allow the parliament to do the course rather than becoming a judicial activist and start giving your own views. Then what happens? You start ignoring the mandate and the essentials of the constitution and its makers' dreams. And you start substituting your personalized agenda. Two judges will decide what the constitution is at a given point of time. Not correct. That's a dangerous trend, which needs to be curbed. That is all the limited power. As far as individual rebirths, rights and liberties are concerned, we have to see, you can't make a society just with individuals. You need to, if you want a society, you must forget rights. Rights should be substituted by duties. Which is a perfect society? A society, instead of demanding rights, should surrender for duties. If duties excel rights, Thus, society will be a perfect society. It will be an ideal society. It will be a frictionless society. By encouraging more and more rights to be liberated through court action, you are actually curbing duties away from all these individuals, which is not good for a society. You can't run a society only with rights. You have to run a society only with duties and also coupled with rights, with its own limitations. This is the essential in running a society under a constitution, in a democratic governance, through a proper constitution. Is what uh, public intellectuals are repeatedly expressing. These are the two concerns uh, as perspectives. Yes? Any other questions? Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, sir. I think I speak for everyone here when I say that this was yet another display of your immense wisdom. Uh, we cannot stop admiring you, sir. Uh, I'm sure that today all of us took a break from learning why the Constitution has said something and got a glimpse of why it has not, intentionally or unintentionally. And I now call upon Lakshmi Narayana, second year BBA LLB honours, to propose the vote of thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. It is a great honor and privilege for me to, to be called upon to propose this vote of thanks. At the outset, I express my sincere gratitude to Senior Advocate Sri N. Venkatraman for being here with us today. Sir, your views on the issues today, your views on the issues today opened up a world of interpretation for all of us here. And it does make us question the possibilities of how constitutional principles can be applied in unique scenarios. Especially the very notion of not limiting ourselves to what is given and written and actually seeing what is unseen and unmentioned and not only help, will not only help us to use this in the future as law graduates, but right now as law students in everyday life. 
Also, the importance of interpretation and inference, and that not just textual but also contextual knowledge, being more objective and less subjective. All of these don't just turn us, turn it into a legal lesson, but more of a life lesson. All in all, it did enlighten the crowd here to have an open mind towards what age-old principles or new principles can be applied in more and more applications every day. A special thanks to our beloved head of department, Dr. Ravishekar Raju, for being here and for his constant guidance and support towards the multiple events organized by School of Law Shastra. My heartfelt thanks to all the dignitaries present here and the faculty and students of School of Law Shastra for their cooperation and aid. I once again thank everyone involved in this event and to make this one a successful one and hope the future holds more opportunities for repeating the same. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lakshmi Narayana. Uh, and uh, now to conclude the event, I request everyone to rise for the national anthem. Janagarna mana athinayak jayahe Bharat bhagya vithata Punjab, Sindh, Gujarat, Maratha, Dravid, Utkala, Bhanga, Vindhya, Himachala, Yamuna, Ganga, Uchala, Jalati, Taranga, Tava, Shubha, Name, Jahe, Tava, Shubha, Ashish, Mahe, Gahe, Tava, Jay, Gatha, Janagana Mangala Thayak Jaya He Bharata Bhagya Vithata Jaya He Jaya He Jaya He Jaya 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 He